Hi everyone, Ryan Dobson here for the Dr. Jeff Show. Summit camps are in full swing and kids are having a blast. In fact, my own son Lincoln is attending right now. There are so many kids who want to go to camp at Summit, but they just need a little help. A generous donor has agreed to match every donation to the Summit Summer programs. Will you help a child learn the foundations of a Christian worldview at Summit? Donate online at summit.org slash match, and every tax-free donation will be doubled. Again, you can find that at summit.org slash match. God bless, and let's join the Dr. Jeff Show. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Liftable, Edify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you would do me a favor and go to the site where you every wherever it happens to be where you get your podcast and review the show if you give it a positive review more people find out about it and that's important because this is the show where i interview major thought leaders to show how our worldview changes everything this week's gonna be a little bit different because i'm interviewing jenna ellis live in front of the students at a summit ministry summer session you may have seen jenna on television she is a newsmax contributor and the former senior senior legal advisor and counsel to president trump she's also the host of her own radio show and her own podcast please welcome jenna ellis to the show Okay, well, welcome to Summit, and I want to say a special welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast audience as well, and introduce you all to Jen Ellis, who's a constitutional attorney and the former senior counsel and personal counsel for President Donald Trump. Yes. And a Summit <laughs> Ministries graduate. Yes, that's the most important thing, actually, because <laughs> it all started there. It all started at Summit, and we're going to get into that a little bit because... Uh, what you've been able to do with the training that you received in a biblical worldview is really exciting. And it, 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 for a lot of the students who are here thinking, I might want to go into leadership. I, I might actually feel a call to do that, to make a difference. You've been able to demonstrate what that's like and what's great about it, what's exciting about it, how to get there, what's tough about it how you have to make difficult decisions when you're in the public eye and you have critics who are uh, extremely mean. So all of that we're going to get into in the time we have tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me, and it's great to be back at Summit. So I was a Summit uh, student when I was 16, and uh, that was such an amazing experience. So you all are very, very blessed to be here. Well, let's, let's first of all talk about being an attorney. Uh, and raise your hands real quickly if you think going into the legal profession is something you might be interested in. All right, so there are a few of you. All right, great. So you, early on in your life, thought this might be a calling for you. Tell us, tell us that story. Yes, yeah, so uh, I was homeschooled all the way through. Anyone here homeschooled? Woo! All right, lots of hands. That's awesome. That's actually where it begins. And um, I was very blessed to have parents that uh, homeschooled me, kindergarten all the way through. And so I was able to uh, attend a leadership school called Teen Pact, uh, which, uh, yeah, there's a few of you guys here as well. Yeah. And so through that program, I d discovered really my love of law and the philosophy of law at age 14. And I've realized that um, you know, you're never too young for God to show you your life's calling. And even though my life's trajectory and what God has done with the passion and skill set uh, that he gave me and that I've developed, um, I had no idea where he would lead with that. Uh, but yeah, at age 14, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer and never strayed from that course. But uh, God definitely had his own plan. So then went to Summit at age uh, 16 and continued to develop um, my faith and an understanding of the biblical worldview um, and then went to law school, <laughs> which um, as you will discover if you go to law school, uh, law is taught completely antithetical to the Christian worldview unless you go somewhere uh, like Liberty University, like Regent University, there are a few that do teach from a Christian worldview perspective and the truth as uh, ultimately the source of law. But generally speaking, in most law schools, including mine, uh, law is taught as completely arbitrary. And so whatever the sovereign in any, any particular nation decides to set up as the rule of law, 
uh, there is no real standard of morality. So here in the United States, uh, whatever our legislatures, uh, Congress or on the state level, decide to implement, uh, it is a social contract theory which is actually based and rooted in secular humanism. And the idea that if we collectively, let's say that we were the Congress right now, and we decided collectively uh, to legislate that abortion is legal and okay, then we have the authority to do that. And so law is taught as completely arbitrary and morality is a subset of that. And of course, that clashed with what I had learned at Summit, what I knew from the truth of the Bible, what I knew from the truth that my parents through homeschooling my church had taught me. And so I had to reconcile those two uh, competing worldviews and determine how do I become an advocate in the law but uh, do that from a truthful, correct perspective that God ultimately is the divine lawgiver and morality is a part of his law. And just as we cannot, as a Congress, uh, legislate ourselves out of the Earth's orbit or decide that we want to repeal the law of gravity, we just don't have that power as human beings. And neither do we have the authority or the legitimacy in the law to draw or redraw moral boundaries that God has set. And so even if we have a judicial branch that in 1973 said, yeah, um, a woman has a so-called right to choose to kill her child uh, willfully, intentionally through a medical intervention, uh, that was no more moral and lawful and permissible according to God's law in 1973 than it will be on the state level when hopefully uh, here in a matter of days or weeks Roe versus Wade is uh, overturned. Yes, yeah, so we're recording this and having this conversation in June of 2022 and uh, so much has changed since the time you came to summit but so much remains the same and I thought that was really interesting the way you identified that what was being taught in your law school was a secular worldview. And of course, coming to Summit helps you figure out, oh, I can see sort of where the battle lines are, I can see the patterns of ideas. But you actually did something about it. And that's, I'm really curious to hear how you went beyond where a lot of Christians are, which is, I don't think this is quite right, to, well, I've got to think this all through and somehow figure it out. Yeah, and reconcile uh, what do I truly believe the Bible teaches and what is the truth? Because Summit will teach you and worldview training will teach you to spot those issues. And most Christians wouldn't even see the conflict. There are so many Christian lawyers who will go and actually advocate under a secular humanist theory and they don't even know they're doing it. And so uh, I studied for the next, you know, probably four years, uh, and through through law school and beyond, and uh, wanted to have a comprehensive argument that answered that question of how can I go into a courtroom, how can I go into uh, Congress and advocate for moral objectivity in law without having to say, well, first become a Christian, then believe as I believe. Um, I wanted to have a legal argument, and so I pursued that. I ultimately uh, wrote a book, which was actually um, my dad's idea, and I'll give credit on, on and we're taping this on Father's we're Day. taping this on Father's Day. <laughs> which yeah. uh, I got to have lunch with my dad earlier today, and um, I'd been talking to my parents about this, and he said, you know, I, you've been talking for several years about writing a book, and I think you should do that. And so I ultimately wrote um, my argument and I called it the legal basis for a moral constitution. And it's a guide for Christians to understand America's constitutional crisis and put our uh, legal documents, our declaration and our constitution in context. Because what I discovered through that research is that we don't just have an argument for the truth of biblical Christianity. We have the only argument that is internally consistent and as C.S. Lewis would describe it, the best explanation for the reality to which God presents us. And I wanted to share that with my fellow Americans in the world and fellow Christians so that you can advocate as much as I can as fellow Christians for the truth of the law and also why I'm so proud to be an American because I could make this same argument in any time, place, nation in history, but America is so unique because we were actually founded 
on the truth and our founders recognizing, not putting their own standard of morality up for debate, but saying we will recognize that truth is self-evident and our rights come from God our creator, not our government, and the sole legitimate purpose of government is to preserve and protect those rights that God gives us. And so we have a beautiful worldview statement in our Declaration of Independence. And that's what our, our uh, entire system of government is founded upon. And if anyone wants to change that, they would literally have to upend and refound our country. O otherwise, they are simply negating and ignoring and trying to tear down our Constitution, which is what every other worldview in this country is trying to do. And that's how we are founded in a very brief uh, preview of the book, how we are founded as a Christian nation because it was the Judeo-Christian values and recognition of God as self-evident truth and the personification of truth. Yeah, and you see a lot of summit reflected in the book. I remember w when I read it, uh, I think when it first came out, just realizing, oh, this is this is summit ideas applied to the field of law. So you you had a fast start when you got out of law school. You you not only wrote a book, but you also were practicing law. You were also teaching at Colorado Christian University and coaching the mock trial team. Tell us a little bit about those early years in your career. Yeah. Uh, so I decided that uh, I wanted to be a prosecutor through um, some events in my life, and um, I was actually um, a victim of sexual assault at the age of 17. Um, I went through <coughs> due process, and I went through um, uh, kind of a crisis of faith at that point uh, to reconcile, okay, what do I believe about um, the truth of who I am is made in the image of God, and what do I believe about due process and those things? And my parents, of course, were very supportive, went through all of that, and I uh, determined going um, into law for the purpose of being a prosecutor and pursuing truth and justice uh, was a very high calling. So I started out doing that and ultimately realized there's a lot of politics <laughs> involved, unfortunately. And, uh, and so ended up uh, a very paradigm shift that was very fascinating and very, um, a really a, a huge time of growth for me was uh, then actually becoming a defense attorney and going on the other side and actually uh, seeing that there's huge ministry as well um, on that side and, uh, and being a defense attorney. And being a defense attorney allowed me to have more time to study uh, writing the book and then ultimately um, accept a position at Colorado Christian University uh, to teach. And that was through, um, if any of you are familiar with Mike Ferris, he used to uh, be, he was the founder of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association um, I reached out to him literally just on Facebook and was like, you won't remember me, but I was a homeschool high school student and I took your con law class like years ago online um, in high school and I wrote this book and I would love for you to read it. Tell me what you think of it and um, if you're willing to write the forward. And he was so kind. He actually uh, set up a phone call and I was so nervous because I was like, this is like talking to, you know, Batman or something <laughs> because he's just like the legal superhero, right? And uh, he was so kind, he ended up writing the forward to my book and um, gave me what I consider one of the greatest compliments of uh, my ministry, which was to say that this is one of the finest defenses of Christian legal theory of our era um, in the book. and. He then took me under his wing and was a mentor, and I encourage all of you, get a mentor, and whatever you want to do, there's somebody who is 10, 20 steps ahead, and they will love to help champion you, and Mike Ferris has been that for me, and uh, he ultimately introduced me to then the president of Colorado Christian University, um, who asked me a very interesting question. I went in just to talk to him about the moot court team. I thought it was gonna be you know, 15 minutes, he's the president of the university, super busy, I had my little presentation and everything. And he's like, okay, but set that aside for a second, Jenna. I wanna ask you a different question. First, you were born. Now you're in my office. <laughs> Tell me what happened in between. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how much time do you have? And he said, I have as much time as you'll give me. An hour and a half later, um, a lot of tears, a lot of like, bonding, I mean, I love, President Armstrong was an amazing, amazing man. Um, he looked at me and he said, Jenna, um, I can see that God has an amazing purpose for your life, and I believe that Colorado Christian University is going to be part of that purpose for the Lord, and I want you to come and teach here full-time, because I think that 
your life story and your passion for law can really influence our students. And without any uh, training, any, <laughs> any idea what I was walking into, I said, absolutely. And uh, that changed the trajectory of a lot of things. I became a fellow at the Centennial Institute and through teaching, had the ability then to start doing media and start promoting my book more, but then also commenting on law and current events from the perspective, not just of the Constitution, but then also where I could, weaving in the Christian worldview. And um, just one door led to another, and God continued to um, just establish my steps, as, as Proverbs says, um, and, um, and the Psalms say as well. And uh, one thing led to another, and I was all of a sudden on national media, on Fox News, um, got a call from the Trump campaign saying, um, you know, we would love for you to be one of our national surrogates um, as an attorney because, you know, you speak very well in the law. And um, at that point, uh, the president had already been elected. He was already in office. And I said, absolutely, I would love to do this on a national level. And um, that was an amazing experience. And um, I was thinking, how much better can this get, right? Um, until one day, I got a very interesting phone call. So you had, a, you had a phone call. You were in Oregon, and you got a phone call from the 202 area code which is Washington, D.C. And I'm a Colorado girl. I'll, all of you out here, you know, we're 303 people. So, yeah, 202, I'm like, this has got to be a sales call. It's Sunday afternoon. So you just, let it, let, it, you just let it go to voicemail. Yeah. But you listened to the voicemail. Thankfully, yes. And <laughs> what happened? Voicemail. What did it say? And I listened to the voicemail, and it said, um, there was a gentleman's voice that said, Hi, Miss Ellis, this is the White House operator. The president is reaching out to you. Would you please return his phone call at your earliest convenience? And I thought, this cannot be right. You know, and if you've ever seen the movie The American President with Annette Benning and uh, Michael Douglas, she, she's a lobbyist who goes in and meets with the president, and then he calls her later just out of the blue, and she thinks it's a colleague that's, you know, just messing with her. And I had this flashback to this movie going, this is a deja vu moment. This cannot actually be the president reaching out to me. Uh, but it was, and so I called back, and I and I said, "Hi, you know, I'm not sure this message was meant for me, but oh yes, we'll put you right through. Can you hold on? Absolutely." Um, so, you know, it's, then the, the White House operator says, um, "All right, Miss Ellis, the president, Jenna, hi, how's it going?" <laughs> and well, hi, Mr. President, <laughs> um, great. How, this is an honor. How are you? Um, yeah, you know, I see you on TV all the time, and um, you have this big, beautiful title, Constitutional Law Attorney. I love it. It's huge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, totally Trump, totally Trump. <laughs> and, um, and I just said, well, that's great. He's like, yeah, so, you know, I wanted to ask you a few questions. And I thought, well, this is the only time I'll get to talk to the President of the United States, so like a good lawyer, I'm going to tell him what I actually think. Uh, which, if you know Donald Trump, was uh, probably the best way <laughs> to handle that, uh, which I didn't know at the time, but about an hour later, and you know, he asked me so many things on that call. We talked about his love of the Constitution, of this great country, and so many other things. Um, he said, well, you know, come see me, come see me. Um, you know, when are you next in D.C.? Well, any time that you say, <laughs> Mr. President, and I will be there. Um, so that was a Sunday. The following Wednesday, I walk into the Oval Office and I'm thinking, you know, as, as a student of the law, loving American history and loving our Constitution, it's like, there's the Resolute Desk. Like, this is the Oval Office. This is amazing. I just think that's hysterical. You're meeting with the President of the United States and you notice the desk. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, the homeschooler. So the Resolute like, so. Desk. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> yeah, so I noticed the desk first. And so it, and it was made out of ship timbers. I don't remember the exact history of it, but mm -hmm. there's a powerful history, historical connection to Yeah, Nicolas America. Cage can explain that later from <laughs> National Treasure. <laughs> but, uh, or is it the second movie? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and then, so then, you know, the president gets up from behind his desk and he comes over and he says, you know, Jenna, so great to meet you. You're a brilliant lawyer and you work for me now. <laughs> and flashback to President Armstrong. Right, and, and um, how God continued to just open doors in my life and say, I'm going to take your 10-year plan, because I'm a type A person, and say, yeah, you think you know what you want to do in life, but I have a plan that's so much greater, that if you will just trust me, you have no idea where um, the deep end is that I'm going to throw you. And so I just looked at me and said, you know, and you work for me now. I think I said something like, okay. <laughs> and, that, and, and then that was it, and it was amazing. 
And um, so we talked for the next, um, I was probably in his office for several hours. People came in and out and um, I was going up that afternoon uh, to New York to do um, an on-set interview with Fox News. And um, he called me later that night after you know we had uh, settled some things in terms of uh, what role I would actually take on. And he said, okay, so you know you got that all settled out and, and everything, all right, great. And he's like, well, so let me ask you, have you ever been to a rally? And I was like, no, but th they look so amazing. And so, oh yeah, well, we're going tomorrow. You should come back to DC. We have room on the plane. And I'm like, the plane? The plane, yeah. <laughs> the plane, yeah. So first day on the job, I'm driven to Andrews Air Force Base with a Secret Service agent, and there's the plane, and it's Air Force One. And I get on, and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, can I, can I take pictures? And he's <laughs> laughing at me, and I'm like, how cool is this? Like, do you ever get tired of seeing this? And he's like, no, it's pretty awesome, you know. So, um, so we get on, and um, he had seated me in the conference room with the entire Louisiana congressional delegation, who all looked at me, and I'm like, hi, what are, what are you all doing here, you know? Um, and Trump comes in, he says, have you met my lawyer? She's awesome, and um, and just had an amazing first trip, and met um, some providentially some people there in Congress um, who are still some of my best friends today. Um, Congressman Mike Johnson, who is uh, one of the strongest Christians on Capitol Hill, and met him that day. And uh, he has been an amazing mentor of mine as well. Wow. Well, this is, this is a incredible trajectory. Now you're working for the president through the campaign. And he, you're representing him. He, he wanted you to represent his campaign from a constitutional law perspective on television. So there was something specific, and he wanted you to take advantage of the, the media experience that you had, but also get you out there uh, to speak the truth that you had written about in a book just a few years before. Yeah, which, which was incredible because um, here here I was as someone who, you know, just um, a, a girl from Colorado who loves this country, loves the law, and from a very young age as well, um, from age 14, um, and even, even earlier than that, um, my parents also, we read through the Bible every year in homeschooling. So by the time I graduated, I had read through the Bible at least 12 times, um, understood, you know, what the stories were in context, because these are people who lived in different times but faced the very same worldview challenges of, of their day. And so uh, the prophet Isaiah, who was looking around at his culture and his uh, his day and he heard the voice of the Lord saying who will I send who will go for us basically to be a culture warrior at the time and obviously a prophet and he said here I am Lord send me and uh, I had always prayed that prayer and said Lord make me like Isaiah that has the courage in the midst of everything that is wrong with the culture and you're looking around and saying why aren't more Christians standing up I want to be the one to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And that had always been my prayer, and God answered that and continues to answer that in some really incredible ways, um, but not without challenges as well, because um, as much as this was a crazy trajectory, and you know, here I was, um, you know, when I walked out of the White House that day, my first call was to my dad, uh, as you know, I was, in, I was in the Oval Office, and he was like, well, how'd it go? And I said, I, I, I think he hired me. <laughs> you know? and, um, and it was just, it was an incredible thing to represent the most powerful man in the world at a very critical time. Um, that was leading up to uh, the first impeachment. And so ultimately, um, what I did as part of the then legal team was to uh, coordinate the legal strategy with um, all of the television media and the people who were talking about it and explaining what his case was and going on during commercial breaks with the hearing, explaining the law, explaining that, but also um, having the really unique opportunity to work for someone like President Trump who never ever said, but you can't talk about God or you can't talk about faith or, or you can't at all. Um, and so whenever the opportunity presented itself, I would always try to incorporate the biblical worldview perspective, the faith-based perspective. Um, I became part of um, the evangelical team as well and um, had some opportunities to, um, to, to tell everyone and to frame my role as a very high-profile Christian in uh, his 
circle or in Trump world. And that w has really incredibly opened doors as well that I've had so many people contact me um, saying we've listened to things um, that you've said, I've sought more after hearing something and that led me back to the church or that led me to Christ. Um, just so it just the ripple effect has really been truly amazing. Some of the things that you and he talked about in that first meeting, he began to talk about immediately. I mean, you, he even asked questions that I don't think most people would ask, like, what do you think of my other attorneys? <laughs> like, how do you answer that? Honestly, so, yeah. I mean, and, and I, you know, and at that point, um, you know, I didn't work for him. I didn't know. I thought it was going to be the only time I'd ever get to talk to him. So um, I answered it honestly, and, um, and I continued to do that. And that caused, uh, honestly, a lot of internal friction with some of my other colleagues, whether it was um, in the administration, in the White House, or on the campaign side of things. Um, for example, if I would speak out against um, the LGBT agenda and say, you know, I would get a call from someone at the campaign saying, well, you know, we, we don't want to offend X, Y, and I said, well, I'm on the evangelical advisory board. I am a Christian, and I'm not going to affirm that. And, and so, so no, and, and basically my response always was, um, and if you really want to argue with me, let's, let's go talk to him. You want to get him on the phone? Because I worked directly and reported directly to President Trump. And um, at that point, they would always back down and be like, well, you know, just, just tone it down a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, right. Um, and one of the other great things um, about President Trump was that um, for the first probably at least three weeks, um, he had me send him the schedule of every single time I was on um, any national media interview. And as, as, as I was walking off set, I got a phone call from him. And he said, you know, great job, you did this really well, and next time you get this question, here's what you can do better. And that was truly amazing to have somebody, I mean, obviously that high profile, have personal training and, um, and really know that he was invested in his team. And he was also very personally invested because once the uh, COVID pandemic happened, you know, the first 15 days to slow the spread and all of that, the first two phone calls uh, that I got saying, are you okay, do you need anything, uh, was my dad and the President of the United States. And that's the kind of person that he is. Wow. Tell us a little bit more about that, because I think a lot of people's r understanding of President Trump, or any president for that matter, is filtered through the national media. And they, they don't, because they don't really know, but they don't communicate uh, what people who are close to the president actually think about him. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what President Trump was like in the interactions that you had with him personally that, that might give us a little understanding. Well, the media doesn't want to get to know him. They don't want to humanize him. They have an agenda, and there's a lot of bias there. And so um, even these you know, great stories, they didn't want to amplify. And so many of the people, um, I, I agree with a few of my uh, colleagues <clears throat> there who say that he was the most underserved president by his own team. Um, unfortunately, there were some, you know, who were constantly working against him and trying to frame him in the worst possible light. And the truth of the matter is that um, he was the nicest, most hilarious person <laughs> I've, I've ever met. Um, I still call him a friend, which is amazing. Uh, one of my, uh, speaking of Father's Day, uh, the first year, one of my favorite stories of him is uh, the first year I was working for him, I was invited to the White House Christmas party. And uh, about a week before, um, w he was talking to me and asking you know, if I was coming. He said, well, are you coming with somebody? Like, you know, do you have, I don't want you to have to come by yourself. And I said, yeah, my dad's coming out from Colorado, actually. And he's only been on the regular tour. So this is really exciting. And he's like, OK, well, that's great. And you know, I'm thinking nothing of that. And my dad and I get there, and I'm, you know, I'm giving him the whole tour, and it's amazing. And, and, and in fact, today, for Father's Day, I posted a picture of me and my dad um, outside the White House. We were going into that event. So moments after that photograph was taken, uh, we walk inside and I get a call from the social secretary and uh, she says, the president has requested to meet your father. So we were escorted downstairs to the diplomatic room 
and it was just us. And my dad, of course, is like, going, I, I didn't come here like knowing this was going to happen. What do I say? And I was like, well, just be like, you know, make America great again. Like, it's fine. He'll talk, you know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then he just was like, okay, you know. And he's like, I'm, I'm glad I wore my red tie because, like, that's like, you know, that's like Trump. And he wore the pen, the American flag pen. It was great. And uh, so the president comes in, and I was like, you yeah, know, Mr. President, this is my dad, Dave. And he's like, hi. And then he, he, uh, he shakes his hand, and he goes, Dave, you're a really good looking guy. <laughs> and my dad is, you know, an engineer and he's he's such a teddy bear, but you know, I mean, this, I think he's a little bit stunned like that's the first, you know, response. It's so Trump. And uh, and he's like, "Oh, well, you know, thanks." <laughs> you know? And then and then Trump goes, "Yeah." And he goes, "But um, but I wanted to meet you because I wanted to tell you something." And as he's shaking his hand, gripping my dad's shoulder, he looks him straight in the face and he said, I wanted to tell you from one father to another that I am so proud of your daughter. Wow. I know, it's an all moment. And my dad got tears in his eyes. And again, that flashback to age 14 when I came home from Teen Pact and said, Mom and Dad, I know that my calling from the Lord is to be a lawyer. And uh, my dad has always supported and championed, so is my mom, um, my law, not career, but ministry, truly. And both my parents have reiterated what we teach here at Summit, which is that vocation is not the same thing as a career. You can have a career with aptitude, making money, you know, other things, but your vocation is when your skill set and your passion meets your calling from the Lord. And to see the fulfillment of so much of what um, I knew that God was calling me to do, uh, having the, the courage and probably the complete naivete of saying, praying that prayer, saying, here I am, Lord, send me, and then having the President of the United States tell my father, I am so proud of your daughter. Um, that was a truly remarkable moment. And my dad, it, framed in his office now, has a photo um, that we all took together that says, to Dave, a great daughter, uh, signed by the President. And um, that moment uh, was very key, and then there was one other one as well. Um, this was a few weeks after the initial shutdown and you know nobody's going anywhere everyone is still wondering you know what really is COVID-19 and how serious is this and um, I was out in DC still because um, that was my job and so you know still talking with my parents long distance and I get a call from uh, the chief of staff at the time saying um, you know come in uh, to to the Oval uh, with the president so I came in you know not not knowing what he wanted and you know which happened frequently and um, so I went in and um, just spent, you know, probably four hours uh, with, you know, and a few other people were there and um, we drank Diet Cokes out of the, you know, the presidential glasses and um, just sat there and talked and, um, you know, and then took care of some business as well. And um, as I was leaving, the chief of staff escorted me out and we were walking along the portico by uh, the Rose Garden in the White House and he said to me, well, uh, thank you so much, Jenna, for coming over tonight because, um, you know, he's always in such a great mood when he gets to spend time with his friends. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, how did this happen, Lord? Like, how, how in the world does the President of the United States first know who I am and call me his friend? And then I thought, how much more should I be marveling every day that the Bible tells us that God, the creator of the universe, literally the most powerful person in the universe, knows us by name and calls us his friend. And as much as I was an advocate and a spokesperson, a representative, an ambassador for the president of the United States, and that responsibility was tough. Every single thing I would do, every single thing I would say, um, even still, everything I say, I am always, um, with a very keen awareness that this reflects him. And that also taught me um, very, very deeply and personally that as a Christian, as an ambassador for Christ, everything I do is a reflection to a sinful world of the truth that I have to testify to, I have to be willing to every day speak and live the truth of ultimately God who calls us friend. And in that moment, I was very convicted, saying, as much as I am taking care to make sure that I am best representing Donald Trump and the President of the United States in his amazing office, how much more should I take care to represent my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? 
that's so powerful because scripture does call us ambassadors and that we're we're always representing the lord in, in the things that we do uh, speaking of uh, of representing the lord you had some interesting interactions with the president related to his faith because a lot of people have talked about this. Is president Trump a Christian? Is he a real Christian or is he just trying to pander to evangelicals and all those kinds of things? Tell us a little bit about some of your conversations. Yeah, and um, and there's you know there are a few that I'll I'll share in different uh, you know in different times and um, you know he he gets so much heat of you know oh he isn't really a Christian, you know, this and that and the other. And, and a lot of um, what I find really interesting is a lot of the behavior that people point out, I love to point out, well, wasn't he a registered Democrat at the time? You know, <laughs> and people change, right? And how much more can we change when we choose to acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior? And we all are daily working out our faith and becoming hopefully uh, daily conform to the image of Christ. And the one great thing about, uh, well, among many things about our founders is that they didn't establish themselves as the perfect reflection of truth or the standard. Their life, so many people like to point out, well, they weren't perfect, you know, sincere evangelical Christians. Well, how many people could look at things in my life and say, Jenna, you're not doing exactly what you should and they would be right. And thankfully, we should all have people in our lives that call us out on those things. But that's not the standard. The standard ultimately is God and that we are conformed daily um, to the image of Christ. And you know, one of the most profound conversations I had uh, with the president that really showed me um, who he is beyond um, you know, loving when people would pray for him and um, having such a great connection with um, the, the faith-based community um, just around the country. Um, one of the, <laughs> the significant conversations was when I represented Pastor John MacArthur during the COVID shutdowns. And uh, he was one who stood firm in saying that church is essential and we are called by scripture to be the church and to meet together as the ecclesia. And he was willing literally to go to prison for his faith. And his response uh, when he was asked by an interviewer, and they said, well, you know, LA County um, is coming at you and they are saying that if you don't stop holding in-person services, they're going to arrest you and take you to jail. And, and his response, and he was, I believe, uh, 82 at the time, um, somewhere in there, and he said, well, you know, then I'll have a prison ministry. I've never had one of those. That'd be fun. Wow. Wow. And he truly yeah. understood that and what it meant to live out his faith and trust in the Lord's sovereignty. And um, so one of, the, one of the most amazing conversations was when I was there in California talking with him, the president called me about something else and um, I spoke to him for a few minutes and I said, I'm actually here with um, you know, a good, good friend of yours, uh, Pastor John MacArthur. And, um, and I said, you know, and he'd love to say hi. And so I put this on speakerphone and I thought, what a bizarre experience to introduce Donald Trump to John MacArthur and have them talk about the importance of the church and religious liberty in this country and love of the Lord. And that just told me how much the media spends so much and you can't trust the bias of people. You have to look beyond that and you also have to uh, know that it is always um, our heart and God says only he can judge the heart. And of course, we can be discerning Christians and we need to uh, judge the theology and be discerning. But what I saw of President Trump was so completely different than how the mainstream media portrays him and still do. And I still talk with him regularly and um, he's still one of the kindest and funniest people I know. <laughs> Jenna, one of the things about leadership is that when you stand up, you're also open to attack. And I think a lot of people see you on television. Oh, isn't that exciting? You know, millions of people saw that interview with Tucker Carlson or, or whoever. And, and then they see you debating and, and, and you're, I mean, you weren't just going on friendly shows. You were going on all kinds of shows 
the, the antagonistic ones were actually my favorites because I would go into any forum willing to speak truth. And I knew their audience, maybe they didn't like it, but at least they had to hear it. Well, now you're well known. You've got tons of social media followers, but you have paid a price for this. And I, I wonder if you just talk about that for a moment, because I want us to be aware that taking a stand and being courageous costs something. It's not free. Yeah, it's really not. Um, and so, of course, um, I was thrust even higher into the intensity of uh, the national spotlight in the aftermath of the 2020 election. And um, having worked for President Trump uh, for that long, having developed this uh, friendship and relationship and, um, and counsel to him, um, that he knew I wasn't afraid to tell him the truth and to contradict the advice of some of his other lawyers. If, if I truly believed that the Constitution or the law uh, said or gave him a certain argument, I would give him all of his options, not just the one that I wanted him to pick, right? Um, and so, so he knew that of me. And so then in the aftermath of the 2020 election, um, he selected me to be one of uh, the members of the legal team. And so I did um, basically what I had done for him before, which was to go and advocate in national media for the cases that were filed by our local lawyers uh, on the ground. And um, that was the most intense period of time um, in my life that uh, was both, I knew I was standing up for truth, I was standing up for um, the principle of the rule of law, that you're not gonna intimidate an advocate from representing a client just because they're your political opponent. Um, but so many of our other local counsel, uh, the day before Rudy Giuliani went and argued uh, the, the case in Pennsylvania, the one hearing, the only reason he had to go and do that was because our local counsel called us the night before in tears, uh, saying that she had gotten a voicemail message from an unknown number, untraceable, that was threatening her and her family. And she just said, you know, I can't do this. And I received those same threats. I had death threats. I had um, threats from people saying uh, the most vile things. They would send me through burner phones the most vile photographs of things. Um, they, there were people that would call and tell me, you deserve to be raped. I mean, just disgusting, despicable things. And um, I had to live with uh, the rest of our legal team basically um, for our safety, quarantined in a hotel for about five or six weeks, and um, and spend you know Thanksgiving away from my family in a you know I mean just the most bizarre locations and um, and truly uh, have to decide: Am I willing to stand up for the truth and for what our rule of law says and allows for claims, um, or am I going to be one that's going to be intimidated? And, um, and that pays a, a really, really heavy toll on, um, on just stress and on life. And since then, um, I've been the target of um, political opposition in terms of trying to disbar me here in the state of Colorado. Um, I'm still working through that. I've had to hire my own uh, counsel and attorneys to fight those fights. Um, I've still been um, attacked and maligned every day on Twitter with things that are just absolutely false. Um, the way my favorite, actually, um, that I laugh about is a Wall Street Journal article that was written um, that the headline was um, something like how Jenna Ellis went from traffic court to the White House. And so it's their favorite troll to be like, oh, you're just a traffic court lawyer. And I'm thinking, well, I went from, you know, third grade to the White House, too. But there was a <laughs> lot of stuff in between, right? But that's how they like to discredit you and to try to malign what you have accomplished and my credentials. They tried to attack my age and my credibility. Um, you know, I mean, the fact that I'm a blonde, you know, I mean, just crazy stuff that was just, you know, completely so far-fetched and, um, and things that if, you know, the tables were turned, if I was working for a different political party president, I'd be lauded as, you know, the, the first, um, you know, female was 35 when she first uh, started working as counsel to president of the United States, and that's amazing, and, you know, go feminism, and all of these other, you know, really bad worldviews, by the way. Um, but, but of course, you know, these attacks continue to persist, and then I was subpoenaed by the January 6th committee, had to retain counsel for that, had to go through uh, that whole process. Um, there are still things, I mean, it's been over a year and a half uh, since, um, you know, unfortunately, 
the legal claims were never heard in court. And so, um, you know, of course, Joe Biden is in the White House right now, but it's been a year and a half since um, I stopped working for the campaign. And I am still, to this day, paying a price for that. And um, I had this same conversation with my parents, and you know, I had it with you and your wife, Stephanie, um, just asking for prayer and saying, you know, please do not allow evil to succeed. Uh, but if it does, please give me the courage, Lord, to stand up firm and say, would I do anything different knowing a price I would have to pay? And the answer to that, of course, is absolutely not. Because when did we get so comfortable as Americans to say that as Christians here, looking at the persecution of Christians in other countries that is despicable, that we think that standing up for truth, we will never have to suffer or pay any penalty for. That's another promise actually in scripture is that you will go through trials and tribulations. But the Bible says, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. We know how this ends. And if they're successful in taking away my bar license or you know, calling me whatever names, I mean, I don't even care at this point. Um, I laugh at, at a lot of them um, on, you know, on Twitter, and they call me, you know, these vile, just, you know, racist, bigot, but insurrectionist, you know, that's my favorite one. I want to get a t-shirt that's, you know, it's like ridiculous, or a hat that's like subpoenaed, you know, there's a group of us that <laughs> want that, you know, to wear it as a badge of honor and just be, and it's so ridiculous, because all of these titles um, the, and these terms that they're trying to malign us, to attack us with our credibility, ultimately what they're trying to do is attack the truth, and it's interesting to me that the worst hatred I get is not actually for representing Donald Trump, it's for representing Jesus Christ. When I post anything faith-related, that is the worst kind of attacks that I get on social media, on emails, on um, you know, people coming up to me and you know, other things. And I think to myself, you know, Lord, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak truth and please continue to give me the boldness and the courage to never back down to these threats and these intimidations. And, um, and I have truly, through th the last few years, although it has been very stressful, it has been very emotional at times, it is not easy. And, and people don't see the hard work that goes into all of this. Um, you, know, you, you just see the, the good things and some of the fun stories. Um, but the thing that I've realized is that when I don't care about the culture and when God says, be of good cheer, and I have faith, which means believing in the promises of God and acting on them. That is Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. It's the stories of all of these very unique individuals that believed in the promise of God and they acted on those promises. And if you go through and you highlight, and in my Bible I've highlighted, like Abraham believed therefore he did. Sarah believed, therefore she did. And you keep going through that verse um, and that whole chapter. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses because we can know that even when it's an unknown future, I don't know what tomorrow holds. But what I do know is that trials and tribulations are promised. God has promised me and said, given me the command, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So if I truly have faith and I genuinely believe in that promise, I will act on it. And there is a great cloud of witnesses of everyone in scripture who has gone before us and all of these amazing testimonies of people like C.S. Lewis, of you know, even the founders of so many people. I mean, look at the, the apostles and the disciples who were literally martyred for their faith and they refused to recant. Why? Because they believed in the promises of God and they acted. And so God called them faithful because the Bible also says that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. And he, we love him because he first loved us. And so having faith, believing in the promises of God and acting on it, that's how we have the fear of God and not of man. And so I can genuinely say that I am fearless because I don't care what the world does to me. And that ultimately is freedom. And the Bible also says that if we walk in him, if the son has set you free, then you are free indeed. And so I have such a great hope and joy and cheer because I am truly fearless and I only fear my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he's the only one that's promised me anything. And I know that he is the truth. I can't think of a better challenge to a rising generation to end with. Jenna, thank you so much for being here tonight.
so grateful. Thank you, Jeff. I, I so appreciate it. And I hope that um, the, the challenge that you have put on yourselves by coming to summit and by growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, because that's what it is. It's not just, you know, Jesus isn't just your life coach to teach you how to live your best life. This is growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord so that we know his character. And by doing that and growing in him, then you will be able to go and fulfill your calling and it will be challenging, but it will be the greatest adventure that you'll ever take and God will be faithful to you because if he can use me in this kind of way, I, I promise you he can use you beyond your wildest dreams because I didn't set out at age 14 thinking, if somebody told me at age 14, honestly at that point I would have said, no way, I can't do that. But I know that at every step of the way God taught me something, he brought me through the next thing so that I would have boldness in the moment to rise to the occasion and say, yes, I will stand firm in the truth. So continue, because the Psalms also say that he is the light unto our path. And that's not a beam way out there. It's every single day and every single moment. So walk in him, be in his calling on your life, and know that when you are in his will, as Pastor John MacArthur told me, Jenna, I think you're going to learn a lot about the sovereignty of God. And he was absolutely right, and I still continue to learn. Thank you to my guest today, Jenna Ellis, for coming on the program. A lot of fun to do this interview with her. As you can tell, the Summit Ministry students are enthusiastic that there's somebody out there who steps up and is willing to move into a royal position for such a time as this. We need that kind of courage. I don't know if you sensed that, but it certainly helps strengthen my backbone and I'm grateful for it. You can also listen to The Jenna Ellis Show on your own podcast platform and follow her on Twitter at Jenna Ellis ESQ, short for Esquire. In the book of Acts, the apostles did not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God. That's powerful. Jenna helps us understand the whole counsel of God for acting with integrity in the legal system and in the political arena, trying to secure justice for all. So grateful for her being on the show and thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for listening to the Dr. Jeff Show. And don't forget, you can help a child attend Summit Summer Session by going to summit.org slash match. All your donations that are tax deductible will be doubled. God bless, have a great week, and we'll see you next time for another Dr. Jeff Show. Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it. And leave a review, if you would, on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about The Dr. Jeff Show. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.